Hey there, world changers. Welcome to another episode of the Power to Save the World podcast, where we'll be learning how to turn your dreams for a better world into real and measurable change. And I have the wonderful job of being able to interview some of the most interesting people in the fields of data science, psychology, and game design. Today's guest on the show is Kimberly Hunter, and she is the VP of Communications at one of the Bay Area's most interesting new environmental data companies called Acclima. And we are gonna be talking about just how interesting air quality can get and just how high tech it can get. And today is a really interesting day to be talking about air quality and maybe Kimberly, what is going on with the air quality right now in San Francisco? Yeah, so actually we are experiencing some of the worst air quality we've ever had in the Bay Area as a result of fires that are currently occurring up in Napa and in the North Bay. Some days folks have compared it to some cities in China. Um, and I'd say we're lucky. We only experience this once in a blue moon, but in 92% of the world, uh, this is a regular uh, cadence of events. Is that really true that it's as bad as it is right now in, in other cities? Yeah, well, you know, the World Health Organization um, has said that, you know, 90%, 92% of, you know, people um, are exposed to unhealthy air and where they live. So air quality and air pollution is a huge uh, global health challenge that we're only just now realizing. It was really funny. I was at a cafe this morning getting a coffee and this guy just out of the blue shows me his iPhone and he says, hey, I've just got this app. And it is showing, look at the bubbles, showing how bad the air quality is right now. In San Francisco, we're getting a 151. And it just had one bubble for all of San Francisco. And I thought, huh, that's because, from what I understand, the EPA only has one monitoring station for a whole city. They're not very granular. Can you tell me a bit more about kind of why we need more detailed data about air quality? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is one of the reasons why Acclima sort of was founded, was how do we increase and expand the data about the quality of our environment? And how do we make it more affordable and therefore making it more accessible? Currently, and let's just note that the U.S., as a result of the Clean Air Act and, you know, regulations that emerged in the protections that emerged in the 50s and 60s, as an industrial nation, we were experiencing incredible air pollution in Los Angeles, uh -huh. in New York. It was taking a public health toll. And so we actually passed laws in the U.S. that set up the current air quality measurement system that is currently in place today by the Environmental Protection Agency. And what that is, is a network of regional air quality monitoring stations that can cost between $250,000 to a million dollars to both set up and to operate annually. They are like typically large sized trailers that are measuring um, air quality over a 24 hour period that is then understanding whether a region is in compliance or not. Mm -hmm. So our current air quality measurements and data is based on a regional system for compliance with the law. And what we're now recognizing is that, particularly even in the instance of the fires right now, we have, um, we have a couple of monitors. In, the EPA has a, a number of sites throughout the Bay Area that help them create the regional look. But what you're really missing is, right now, an entire region might be red. Well, where is it actually red in that region? Or where is it green? Or, you know, when we have um, increased data, can we create high-resolution maps that help us make decisions and guide our way through our life to make healthier decisions. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what we, what we focused on doing. And, and so what we wanted to do was taking our system of low cost, small scale sensors, as well as our ability to plug in high fidelity, you know, air quality measurement into our system. How can we collect data, high quality data at a lower cost, and then translate that into information and insights that people can use. And from what I understand, it's really important to get that detailed information for air quality because it changes. It can change block by block, right? Like just one for a whole city just really doesn't tell you that much. Yeah, yeah. So we were actually uh, conducting research over the past year in Oakland um, in partnership with Google and the Environmental Defense Fund where we were creating a high resolution map of air pollution in the West Oakland area. And what we really learned was that air pollution is highly variable, that mm -hmm. the quality of our air can shift 
block by block, um, and that it's highly dynamic. And so going back to our initial kind of starting point of looking at a map and seeing it being all red, yellow, or green, that's actually not really the case in real time, is that, you know, our, our pollution is moving through a city, depending on traffic flow, weather, industry, and a whole host of factors that can really shift the health of the people in these neighborhoods and the health of a city. Yeah, I remember seeing, I went to a talk that Acclima did in San Francisco recently, and the lines that were most red on the map of this air quality monitoring that was done were when the cars had to go up a hill really steeply. Every time I go up a steep hill in my car now, I'm thinking of that. I mean, just as an example for how granular data can really get into to your mind and potentially facilitate change. I mean, nobody would know that if we couldn't see that information. Yeah, and I think what's actually illuminating about the fires right now is that, you know, when I look outside right now, I can see some blue sky. I mm-hmm. can see, you know, across the street from myself. But what we're actually learning is air quality right now, I just got an alert, has shifted to red this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And that's because there are micro fine particles that are in the air as a result of this fire. So, you know, yes, it's, it's the pollution that you experience sort of on hills or with cars idling. But I think what helps us is when we have, when we become more aware of what we don't see or what we don't know, but that the circumstances that can change or shift our air quality, that's when we start to connect the dots, right? So now after Mm. you see those maps, when you are pulling onto the interstate and you're seeing the freeway backed up, you're thinking to yourself, you're almost visualizing in your mind, like what the air quality could be. And before now, I don't think we've really thought about it in that sort of realistic detail. I mean, we were just just chatting before we started about how there's this time that's happening. There's a confluence of technologies that have just happened that have enabled this really detailed data be able to come out that just wasn't available. Even 10 years ago, we couldn't do this. So what's happening in technology now that's suddenly making this super granular air quality monitoring? I mean, not just for air quality, but for all of these other different data metrics happening. Yeah. So, I mean, when we look at what's happened over the last seven or eight years, we have the convergence of and the emergence of low cost sensors and more affordable technologies for measurement. We have cloud computing, which enables us to store enormous amounts of data and to work with that data within the cloud. We use Google Cloud. And then we also have machine learning and artificial intelligence. So that's accelerating our ability to combine data sets and really extract insights. So that actually creates the actionable component that is really necessary for change to occur. And so it's this confluence of technologies, as well as I think also in through personal wearables, so Fitbits and other devices and technology that's emerged in the last 10 years. You know, we've started to understand what the quantified self is, to understand how many steps I'm taking in a day, understand, log my meals, you know, I can really better manage my personal health and well-being as a result of some of these technologies. And we really see Acclima as being sort of a Fitbit for the planet so that we can use this environmental data and deliver it to different stakeholders to enable decision-making that improves both your own health as well as the planet's health. Yeah, I was really excited to see in your bio that you wrote the Fitbit for the planet because I've been using that in a lot of my content as well. And I was like, right on, it's happening, Fitbit for the planet. We're all starting to to get there now. But I think we might have just jumped ahead a little bit too much. I just wanted to make sure everyone who's listening understands what these projects are in terms of mapping the air quality. From what I understand that you mapped all the air quality by street in both Oakland and San Francisco, And did you put air quality monitors on Google streetcars? Is that how it was done? Yeah, so we actually started, um, we started mapping the indoor environment. So Mm -hmm. Acloma actually started deploying our technology inside the inside of buildings Mm -hmm. to quantify the environment that affects health, productivity, and comfort for people. And then in the last four years, we took that sensing platform and shifted it to mapping the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And so we started in 2014, actually, in Denver, where we equipped three Google Street View cars with sort of our sensing platform. There was actually a, a research project happening called Discover AQ at the time, and we were actually research and development partners with the 
Environmental Protection Agency. So we actually do research with the EPA on how do we advance small scale sensors and this next generation of measurement. And so as part of that, the next, next iteration of the project was coming to California. So for the last two years, actually, we've been driving the Bay Area, Los Angeles, the Central Valley, and part of that work was also an extensive mapping of, of West Oakland. So what the California driving has enabled us to do is continue to better understand how do we map using vehicles and how do we create methodologies that enable us to representatively sample a city, but also then test that technology to ideally scale it in the future. Right now, what we've been doing over the last two years is had a side-by-side -side package of small-scale, low-cost sensors next to reference equipment that is creating a truth for the sensors to learn from. For the last two years, we've been developing this mobile sensor package and testing it with equipment to train the sensors and have them understand how to, how to operate. And then that package is what we want to scale and we'll be scaling to more vehicles. And the idea is, is that, you know, let's go to a future world where we're able to take this mobile box and install it in additional vehicles, in school buses or mail fleets or city buses. And then what you have is through all of these different vehicles driving around in a city, we can actually have a, a real-time sort of network of measurement occurring across a large amount of space as opposed to just a single unit of measurement in one place, which is, uh -huh. which is currently, or what we see is the value of actually having a heterogeneous network because we do sensor networks inside of buildings. We can do outdoor stationary as well as mobile. So we really see a world where, and this is kind of part of this idea that we're going to have trillions of sensors out in the world one day and that environmental sensors will effectively be deployed in a way that we have this real time data set that's, telling me where I need to, the best way to walk to uh -huh. you know, pick up my dry cleaning, or if I'm going on a bike ride, what areas to, go, to, to choose during that time of day in that area. And I think that's going to be the kind of way that we translate environmental data into this environmental intelligence that we see really helping drive a, a, you know, the future. Yeah, so instead of that, that guy that showed me his phone this morning at, at coffee that just had one dot for all of San Francisco, what people will be able to see in, in this future is you'll be able to go right into where you're at, the specific address, the specific street, and you'll be able to get this real-time feed, sort of almost true to maybe not the second, maybe the day, of what the air quality is like in that very specific area. And you've, and you've done those maps. You can, you can see them for these, for these whole districts. Yeah, well, I think it's the, the high resolution map. So it depends on the stakeholder, right? So mm -hmm. for cities, they want to understand where the hot spots are and mm -hmm. where are areas in which transportation infrastructure can be adapted or improved or optimized to reduce pollution burdens in a place, um, especially when we're thinking about new policies for sort of managing the urban environment and having data to demonstrate when air quality is improved by these policies. I mean, we've really been missing that. You know, we uh -huh. have our cities and our buildings with an absence of data. And when we can actually have a feedback loop that enables us to understand the impact of the solutions we are implementing, we can make our resources go a lot longer and a lot further. So for places like a, a city mayor, this is where that data can really help inform sort of how they need to manage a city to help improve air quality. And then on the flip side, for a citizen, we want to see sort of environmental intelligence embedded in our day-to-day -day lives. So when I'm pulling up um, my Google Maps to go to Starbucks, not only can I choose the least polluted route or the most healthy way to get there, I can also potentially see what the, what the pollution is like at Starbucks or when it might get worse in the day. So it's not just real time. It's actually more to be able to feed models to ensure more predictive and better um, understanding of, of both present situations, but also future. So right now, the models are data starved. And that's why we have a more regional perspective. But with increased data, increased high quality data, we can help improve these models and create more predictive tools to better to ma manage air quality. And have you had any wins yet? Have you had, you've put the data out there and then some things actually, I mean, it's great. I mean, having the data is one really big step, right? 
But then the next step is making sure that that data actually turns into change. Have you had any wins where you've been able to be like, we did it, we did it? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think we're in early days of, uh, you know, we've been really driving the collection and understanding the, the applicability of this data in different situations. But one thing I can share from the California, California driving, and, and we're going to be sharing more actual data stories and snapshots from California in the next coming weeks, which I'm actually really excited about. But there was a situation where I was meeting with a chief sustainability officer in one of the cities that we had mapped and showed him that there was actually a methane hotspot where there was a, a city bus refueling station. And this was just briefing him on sort of our, our ongoing efforts, like here are some things we're seeing, is this the sort of stuff that cities would see a find a value? And he whipped out his phone and took a photo of that slide while uh -huh. I was sharing it. And he was like, you know, I'm meeting with our Department of Transportation later and it would be really helpful to show them this data because we're really pushing for 100% electric buses. Mm -hmm. And if we can demonstrate that our natural gas buses are still creating greenhouse gas, gas emissions, that is a data point that helps me drive the conversation towards sort of different solutions. So in the possible future, do you think that you really, will a Klima really be able to deploy this type of technology and data around the whole world? Do you, really, do you see that happening in the future? That's our, that's like our mission. Like every city, everywhere, you know, no matter where you are, you can, you can, you can see it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, why, um, that's why we were founded and that's why we're structured the way we are. I mean, we're really designed to operate at scale and to try and figure out how to bring our technology um, into more cities, more buildings, more communities. You know, when we look at sort of uh, working with folks like Google, um, they have the sort of global infrastructure and they see the value of this kind of data. And so that is our work in terms of we're looking for um, partners that want to expand and the ability to collect this data, as well as folks that really want to use it. So yeah, we are on a big ambitious mission to wrap the world in environmental data mm -hmm. and are working every day towards that. And what is the like hardest thing? Is there anyone that's against you? Like, for example, is, is the, the oil industry, do you consider them to be an enemy? Or is there something that's making it hard? Like, what's the biggest barrier, I should say? I think what we're seeing in the current paradigm with respect to fighting climate change is been a lot of effort from companies in the private sector to do their part, particularly um, as some national leadership has been sort of taken a, a back seat. And so we're actually having a lot of conversations with folks that see an enormous amount of value in this kind of data and how it can help them improve their systems and how it can help them better manage their facilities or um, take into account what they can, yeah, what they can do to, to play a positive role. I think the, you know, our challenge is how can we, you know, move faster and make this more affordable and accessible. You know, we've got some great partnerships with the Environmental Protection Agency and others. I mean, I think that that's really been part of ACLIMA's foundation is that we really see ourselves growing through partnership and through collaboration. For me and for my role at ACLIMA, you know, I want to be engaging all of these different stakeholders because I think that we all want to see a healthier planet and a healthier environment for our children to thrive for our families to, to live in. And so how do we have more conversations around how this data can unlock that kind of reality in the future? And one thing that I find uh, really interesting about air quality is that when you, it hits two birds with one stone. When you get, make the air quality better, you also reduce the carbon dioxide emissions because the same stuff that makes bad air also makes CO2. And air quality is not as politically polarizing as carbon dioxide is. So do you see a, an exciting future where you can really help you kind of almost indirectly, but still very much so, support renewable energy and electric vehicle use by being like, hey, here's another reason why, uh, why fossil fuels aren't the best thing. Yeah, well, and as I was saying earlier, I mean, we see our data actually supporting those complementary energy choices and sort of the next generation of policies to, to manage climate change. And you're right, you know, the same emissions that we're putting into the air, we're putting into our bodies, you know? Mm -hmm. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, you know, the quality of our environment affects all of those and affects us. 
And if we can provide more intelligence on the air we breathe and help people make better decisions, then we're, we're working towards a shared reality where, where we value those things and we value the planet in which provides them to us. Uh, you have a background in political communications. I mean, I bet that you can really see this data essentially bringing technology and policy together. You know, often they're seen as really different things, like what the government does and legislation and there's Silicon Valley over there. I mean, this is a case where they really need to be married together, that you can use this information to help enable really good quality policy. I mean, from all your background, can you really start to see those two domains come together? Absolutely. I mean, that was one of the reasons when I first met Davida Acklam as CEO back in 2014 and heard what she was working on. I mean, the light went on immediately for me is mm-hmm. that this sort of data could be transformative in our policy making. I, I believe that technology has an incredible opportunity to bridge divides to create shared context, to really transform how we manage our planet and how we can relate to each other. And that's why I came to San Francisco was to take that public policy background and and the change that I wanted to see in Washington, D.C. and see how we can use technology to help accelerate that. When we are able to to show maps and and show people the visualizations of of what our air looks like and to policymakers what that means, they can make smarter decisions. We can all make smarter decisions. And I get really excited about actually the complementary aspects of how this data informs policy, how it helps support everyday people in making better decisions, and ultimately how we come together as a society to combat climate change and think about where we want to be in 500 years, because I think we still want to be on this planet. Mm. In order to do that, we're going to need to figure out how to manage our resources more smartly. Although I know a lot of people that desperately want to be on Mars and on the moon. (laughs) And I'm like, well, we've got to get this planet like working first if you're going to do that. So it's maybe a little bit out of order. Yeah. You know, I think that there's a couple of different, yeah, there's, there's different ways of looking at it. I, I think that our, our planet still has a really great shot. And <laughs> yeah. I believe that, you know, we as people have a lot more agency and a lot more of a voice in this, in this paradigm than we think we might. And when you can have this kind of data, when, it, when people are factoring in air quality to the homes they buy, the economic decisions they make, you know, maybe it's when we start to externalize create some val- putting value on these sort of external resources that we as a, as a society can start to, to place more value on our air. Okay, so overall, there seems to be that there's this sort of incredible new shift happening all over the world where we're able to use technology to get great insight into nature, into the biosphere, and then really use this information to solve the world's biggest problems. And I was just, I was, I was writing an introduction to my book today and I just summed it up with this whole concept of, um, which sort of fits into the whole like Mars thing. I'm really not personally that into Mars, but I know a lot of people are. I mean, when you work in sustainability full time and in the environment, it becomes your whole world, like environmental sustainability, environmental sustainability. And it's kind of what for. And I was thinking that, well, once we've sort of ironed out the, the kinks or solved a lot of these problems, we're really opening up the future for, or opening up the world for what the next step of humankind will be. Like what happens when we can solve these these air quality issues, these climate issues, these social problems that we have. It's an incredibly exciting time with all this technology coming together. And then once we've reached this kind of cybernetic earth of all this information, I mean, what would be the next phase for, for human civilization? I mean, what's in store for us next after we solve these big things? Big question. Well, you don't you have know, to answer it. I would, I, would, I would hate to speculate because I think <laughs> that, um, you know, the, the, the future, depending on how you look at it, can have a million different possibilities. Yeah. So I think that in the, in the future, you know, when I think about what is next is if, if, if we think about our cities of the future being automated and humans are, I'm not sure what we're doing, but we're not manning the, the fort of the control tower anymore. You know, I'm looking forward to having environmental data actually helping to, to automatically manage our cities in uh-huh. more sustainable ways. What we can actually, we can use technology to automate some of these more sustainable decisions 
and take humans out of it because we know we know the kind of the, the data that can drive our our transportation systems of the future or our our navigation systems or even how our buildings and our homes are being managed in terms of of air quality so I'm not sure what the future has in order. I mean, I think it'll be, it's an exciting time. And uh, I, I'm really excited about sort of what environmental intelligence can, can translate to in terms of how we live our, our day-to-day lives. And uh, this is one thing I always ask everybody I talk to, that if there was just one thing that you could achieve in your career or one thing that could change, that you see that would change, that would sort of unleash, sort of would kick the log on all these other things, what would that one thing for you be? I'd love to see more technologists and these incredibly smart folks applying their time and energy to technologies that are going to help us manage the planet and make the world a better place. I, I think that there's a lot of opportunities in that field, a lot of value in putting time and energy into solving some of these big, big challenges. And so as excited I, as I am about autonomous vehicles or social platforms, I I want to see a Manhattan project focused on the planet. I want to I want to bring in the smartest and best and brightest folks and let's let's come together and figure out what's the ways technologies can really solve and how can those technologies support people in solving the problems. That's one of the reasons that brought me to San Francisco and I'm excited to be at Acoma where we're doing that every day and would love to see more more folks doing the same. Yeah, it's really wild when you move to Silicon Valley. I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, hacker houses and the technology scene. And I was really kind of shocked by, well, maybe shocked is the wrong word, but I, I totally get where you're coming from when you see all these like incredibly brilliant people. And you're like, come over here. We've got amazing problems to solve. Come on, come on, come on. Don't worry. And they're maybe working on a technology project that isn't really going to kind of have that much impact. And you see so much genius and potential here. And you kind of want to, like, they're like waving the flag, being like, come over here, come over here, amazing stuff. And we'll keep waving the flag saying, <laughs> come over here, come over here. Um, yeah, I totally, I totally share that with you, that the, the more we can do to inspire some of these very talented technology people to join in on this incredible movement about environmental data and feedback loops and all that, that would definitely be a big win and exciting thing to achieve. So I think we've probably talked through all of the most exciting things about Acclima. It was really wonderful talking to you and thank you so much for coming on the show. Hopefully we can meet in person one day as we both live in San Francisco. It's very thick with a lot of air pollution right now. And what can people do to support Acclima or find out more? Or there'll probably be people listening who are actually working in cities and in government departments who might be interested in having their city mapped as well. Yeah, so I would say just come online and check us out a bit more. You can go to acclima.io, which is our website, or um, check out our blog, which has just su- such a rich amount of resources around uh, what, we, what we know and what we're learning and who we work with. And then shoot us an email if you're interested in learning more um, for cities. You know, we are actively you know, in conversations with folks um, around bringing environmental intelligence to their, to their city if you're in business, or if you're also looking to work at, at a mission-based sort of technology company as well. Check us okay, out. Okay, and you can see, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see that Kimberly has a, um, a beautiful view at the side of her warehouse window-style office. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Kimberly, and thank you to everybody for listening. This has been a really exciting conversation about this incredible trend that's going on in environmental data. If you would like to watch it on YouTube, you can check out the YouTube channel, How to Save the World. And if you're on YouTube and you want to listen to it on the podcast, you can find it on the iTunes store. And if you want to sign up to my website, katiepatrick.com, there's a whole lot of other free information there about how you can start learning more about how to apply these measurement-driven techniques and behavior change and gamification design to your environmental project. Thanks so much for listening and keep on making Saving the World the Greatest Game on Earth.